And we can choose whichever flop, flop we want by the address, and then we can strobe the W thing to write it into that one or that one. But what about reading? How do we combine the two outputs from our flip-flops into a single output, which we'll call D out here? And I'm going to need a new piece of paper, so we'll... Okay. Uh, let me just uh, copy that over quickly. So I've redrawn things now without the input side of things. That circuit would be exactly the same, but to make things easier when we talk about how we get the output out, I've just wiped it away so we can just refer to what we need. So we've got the two flip-flops, zero and one again. We've got our address input, and we've got one output, which we've called D out. Now the first difference from writing is that we don't need any sort of read signal to say we want to read the value because we have the output always live, storing whatever's in flip-flop one or in flip-flop zero. What we do need is to connect the output of flip-flop zero and the output of flip-flop one, combined with the address input, 2D out so that when there's a zero on here, we get whatever's in that one there. And whenever there's a one in there, we get whatever's in that one. And the way we do that again is we use an AND gate. So we can start off by putting an AND gate in here, connected to that. So now we have, when A in contains zero, the output of here will always be zero. When A in contains one, the output of here will be whatever the value of Q is. That's from the truth table we saw for the last one. And we can do the same, just in the same way for this one here. So we can bring the output down and we can put it into an AND gate. And actually an AND gate is symmetrical, so it doesn't matter which input we connect things to. We can use a NOT gate again, connect that in there and connect that to that. So now whenever A in contains zero, this output here, this NOT gate contains one, and we AND that with this thing here. So we now have two values if A in is from zero, then this one has the value of Q and this one is guaranteed to be zero because that's going to be zero. Anything added with zero is zero, so this will always be zero. If it contains one, this will be zero because anything added with zero from the not gate is zero and this will contain whatever this value is Q is. So we've now got two signals which are either the value from the flip-flop if the right flip-flop is selected, zero or one, or it's zero. So we just need to combine these two together to produce our output. And the way we do that is by using an OR gate. We connect the inputs like that. So what's coming on here? Well, let's think about the truth table for an OR gate. We have our two inputs, A and B, and our output Q. So we've got a value of 0 and 0. 0 or 0 is 0. 0 or 1 is 1. 1 or 0 is 1. And 1 or 1 is obviously 1. So what we've got happening here, when A in is zero, the output of this AND gate is zero. So anything ORD with zero is whatever the value of the other one is, so B is zero or one. So the output, when this is zero, is whatever the value of this output is. On the other hand, if A in contains one, this AND gate will contain the value of Q and it goes in there, so it'll either be zero or one. But this one will be zero because this will be one, inverted zero, and it was zero, everything is always going to be zero. So we've got zero on the second input. So zero or zero is zero, one or zero is one. So again, the output follows the other input. And so we can very quickly, just using an OR gate this time, merge the outputs of the two AND gates to create D out. And actually we could design the circuit so all of these things were done using NAND gates because they're one of the simplest things to build, particularly as we've got the inverted outputs from our flip-flop. Again, you could build that out using many address lines and many OR gates and AND gates to produce your whole memory. And that's how static RAM, like you'd find on here, works. You have the equivalent of a flip-flop for each bit and you have address pins that decide which ones are stored but not quite. There's actually another trick to how the memory is arranged in your typical RAM circuit to make things fit onto a piece of silicon easier. So what they actually do is, rather than having, and we're going to use four flip-flops here, rather than having them arranged in one long line like that, we actually arrange them into a grid. And so we now have two rows, zero or one, and two columns, zero 
or one. So in this case, we'd have two address inputs, A0 and A1, and we use one set of these to select which row it is, and we use the other to select which column it is. So if we want to access flip-flop zero, then we select row zero, column zero. If we want to access flip-flop one, we select row zero, column one. If we want to access flip-flop three, we select row one, column one. And so we have a grid, effectively, of cells where we can store our data. And then again, we have the multiplexers using OR gates to combine them together to produce our output. And then we can stack these in 3D to produce the sort of 8-bit outputs like we've got here. So this is a 6264 chip, which I pulled out of a BBC Micro, made in West Germany. That shows how old it is. It's probably made by this week 15, 1986. On here, you've got eight input outputs for the data and a read-write select pin, uh, five volts input, zero volts input, and the rest of it will be, so there's eight K, so there's eight, one, nine, two, memory locations, that's two to the power of 13, I think. And I shall also do two to the power of 12, two to the power of 11, two to the power of 10, so that Sean can check it on a calculator and select the right thing that I've written down. <laughs> so we have two to the 13, and if you look at the data sheet for this memory chip, which I should bring up on the laptop, so we can see that we actually have our row decoder, which gets eight inputs, and our column decoder, A0, A9, A10, 11, and A12. So this is 8,192 memory locations, and they're arranged of a grid of 256 rows and 32 columns. And of course, they're then stacked eight high so they can store each of the eight bits. It's exactly like the way the streets and houses are arranged in places like Manhattan. You've got a grid of things and you select which street you want and which avenue you want and you go to that intersection and that's where the memory location is stored. Only if the two inputs differ. If they're the same, then the outcome's the zero. So here we go, a zero exclusive order, the zero, they're the same, it's zero.